All right, so welcome to this um, session as part of the Science and, and Medicine Strand. It's the, the penultimate session in the Strand um, called Curing Cancer. Is it all about the science? Um, my name is Ellie Lee. I um, have no um, proper uh, qualifications whatsoever to be chairing this session, frankly. Um, so I'm... <laughs> I'm, I'm not a scientist, um, or that kind of scientist anyway, I'm a sociologist. Um, I direct a, a research centre at the University of Kent called the Centre for Parenting Culture Studies. Um, I mean, I suppose the, 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 the way in which um, cancer has, has come up as part of discussions that I've been in, involved in is more to do with um, aspects of, of the preventative side which I in a way that I've always thought was a bit peculiar um, enter into discussions around um, family planning and then looking after children um, so there's obviously lots of discussions about the hormones and cancer um, and the whole question of hormonal contraceptives um, and over the years um, it's always formed part of scare stories and panics about hormonal contraception. Um, I don't know if people remember, but a few years ago, there was a really big one. Um, and then a lot of women came off the pill. Um, and there were lots of issues around unintended pregnancies. Um, and somebody called Val Beryl at the time stepped in and, and did a load of work to, to uh, reconstitute understandings of risk. Um, the other way it's, it comes into it is around um, what, to my mind, seem to have been peculiarly ineffective messages, which say that if you want to reduce your risk of breast cancer, have loads and loads of kids and then breastfeed them for a really long time. Um, <laughs> which doesn't seem to be something, for understandable reasons, that, that is influencing um, fertility behaviour and, and women's behaviour massively. Um, but I've always found it interesting that that somehow has crept into um, efforts to change the way that women behave in, in relation to having children and, and looking after them is, is to uh, warn them about cancer risks. Um, anyway, so maybe that is pertinent to our discussions, in fact. Um, so, so that can come up. The other reason, though, which I think is why Ella asked me to do this, is that I actually um, had breast cancer myself um, during the pandemic. Um, so I was uh, diagnosed with it um, in late 2020 um, and then have had a lot of treatment um, during that time. Um, so um, she was a bit nervous about asking me, didn't know whether it would <laughs> put me off or encourage me to do this. But actually, um, as a result, um, I suppose it's something which for a lot of people, when they've had a, a serious illness comes out of it, you become interested in learning more about it. Um, so I'm actually very pleased to have this opportunity to, to be part of the discussion. Um, Carol Sikora um, has ended up not being able to be here. Um, so big apologies from him. I'm sure p people were looking forward to hearing from him. Um, but unfortunately, he's not on our panel. Um, but we have still got a, t a terrific panel. Um, so it's these three people here. I'll introduce them and then they'll do their opening comments in turn. Um, so beginning with uh, Elliot Forster, um, who's the chief executive officer at F-Star Therapeutics um, and also the non-executive chairman of Avacta PLC. I don't know anything about either of these companies, so I can't tell you anything about them, but I'm sure Elliot will say a bit of that as, as he's going along. He's also an honorary visiting professor of molecular and clinical cancer medicine at the University of Liverpool. Um, so he definitely knows a lot about all the things we're going to be talking about. So he's going to start us off. Um, second is Nikki Drury. Um, Nikki is a genomic counsellor, so a counsellor dealing with genetics and, and um, advising people on uh, genetic susceptibility to diseases um, in, based in Nottingham. Um, and she's a former member of the United Kingdom Human Genetics Commission. And obviously that whole dimension to um, the causes of cancer is very important. Um, and then last of all, Miranda Green, um, who is a journalist and commentator, deputy pen, uh, opinion editor of the Financial Times, a former Liberal Democrat advisor and co-founder of The Day. I don't know what The Day is either, so you can tell us about that too. Um, yeah, that, it's okay because that's kind of a, that's slightly ancient anyway, but oh, okay. it's, it's a news news website, a debating website okay. uh, for teenagers and schools, which is how Terrific. I know Claire and we're okay. debating matters all right. and all of that. Yeah. 
Um, so Miranda's written a lot, but also, I mean, she's mainly here because she was also a cancer patient um, recently and, and wrote a lot about it very interestingly um, in the FT. Um, so, you know, that's, that's what we've got. Um, Elliot. There we are. Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, thanks very much uh, again to the Festival Ideas, the Battle of Ideas. Uh, I was just reflecting earlier, this is my 20th year uh, coming here in all sorts of um, guises, and, and it's a delight to be here uh, again in this, uh, what is at least for me, a new venue, and uh, to talk about a subject that I spend uh, not only um, my professional time thinking about, but um, having uh, had some close family members uh, die from cancer at far too young an age, uh, also think uh, emotionally about uh, as well. And, and it's a, um, for all of us, uh, I know a uh, topic uh, that um, we may worry about occasionally, but certainly think about and hear of uh, in the news. And it's a, it's a, a pleasure to um, debate uh, whether a cure for cancer um, is just all about the science. Uh, let me give you a spoiler, uh, no. <laughs> so I think I've got a few minutes longer than I would typically have for the beginning, which uh, for those who know me will be dreading because they can't shut me up anyway. So here we go. Um, I was uh, out for lunch yesterday, uh, pea soup and a cheese and chutney sandwich in a very small cafe, not far from where I live in Oxfordshire, and it was raining. Um, and it was raining a lot, and so the cafe was full, and it was full because people didn't want to go out into the rain, so they'd hang on to a cup of coffee. And it's rather a nice thing because people then, having finished their coffee, start to talk. And I was uh, sitting opposite my wife, but next to a family, normal family, couple of kids, man, uh, woman, uh, and some friends, clearly as well, uh, also with a couple of kids and chatting away. And they were talking about all sorts of things, and I couldn't help but have my ears prick up when they started to talk about the flu vaccine. And it is now flu vaccine season. Um, and one person talk, turned to the other and said, well, I'm not having the flu vaccine because I don't want to get flu. Now, it was all of my self-control required to stop me turning around and pointing out the... Um, contradiction uh, in that particular statement. Let me use the word contradiction. And um, in, instead of that, I kept it to myself and thought, I know, I'll talk about this tomorrow. So here I am talking about it tomorrow. And why does it even make any difference whatsoever uh, to the conversation around a cure for cancer? Well, the fact is that um, there will not ever be a cure for cancer. Uh, if you were hoping there was going to be one, I'm sorry to be the breaker of the news because of several things. So one is that cancer is not a single disease. Um, it's at least dozens and maybe hundreds of different diseases with different genetic, uh, biological, and environmental origins. Uh, some are familial, uh, as you know. Uh, some uh, most, in fact, just occur spontaneously because we're living life and our immune system can't see uh, the broken cells anymore or because we got some sort of infection uh, at some point in our life, and it's uh, virally driven. And there'll be other things that cause cancer that we know nothing about. Um, and I'll come back and, and I'll do the Carol slot in just a minute and talk to you about the advances we have made uh, so as not to be too pessimistic. But what we can do, and as close as we'll get, is to do two things. One is to treat cancers and turn them into chronic diseases. And that will require understanding of data. It will require discipline by the healthcare givers and it will require in particular discipline uh, by the patients. Um, the other thing we should try and do is prevent cancer occurring at all. And in that, we have much more of an opportunity, probably not for people uh, of my age, uh, but the youngsters uh, that you guys deal with, um, you know, my kids' age have got much more chance and of course their kids even more chance than that. But again, in order to do that, it requires a societal ambition, which is much greater and in fact hits headwinds every single day uh, than the one uh, we're willing to accept today. Uh, and the first of those is the willingness uh, to participate in broad ranging uh, clinical uh, trial activities um, and longitudinal studies of disease, obviously in this case cancer, uh, and enable uh, the data that's emerging from those uh, to be used, not just by 
the NHS, uh, another health sector, but also by companies like my companies who will use those data to try and find uh, new treatments, but more importantly, uh, to find uh, prognostic or uh, advanced uh, diagnosis uh, of these cancers to prevent the cancer occurring in the first place. And why does therefore the woman um, and man who are sitting next to me's conversation uh, become uh, important? Well, it becomes important because, and I'm sure you'll hear from other panel members, during the course of COVID, uh, we have seen the inexorable rise uh, of an anti-science fraternity uh, who in particular describe themselves uh, as anti-vaxxers. Uh, just so you're aware that this is not the first time this has occurred, uh, many of you will have heard of a guy called Andrew Wakefield who uh, I had the misfortune to work with at the Royal Free when he was practicing medicine there, who has now moved uh, to California uh, and sits at the heart uh, of a state uh, in which there is so much uh, anti-vax that uh, the state was unable to reach uh, herd immunity uh, during the COVID pandemic because so many people refused to take a vaccine. Um, that mentality, by the way, um, will be the thing that prevents us from preventing diseases eventually because in order for uh, the prevention of many different types of tumours to occur, we are going to have to collectively provide our data uh, and trust the feedback uh, that comes back, and that becomes very, very important. Just so you know, the first uh, major anti-vax uh, prote protest occurred in Leicester uh, in 1850, um, when the smallpox vaccination uh, legislation was passed, um, and about 10,000 people turned up at that one, so we're, we've got a little way to go. I'll do the Carol thing for a minute or two, if that's okay, Ellie. Yeah. So, um, I may have come across, I've just been sitting in a panel which was called Build... No, I, that was my title for it, Build Better Britain. Um, Broken Britain is back or something along those lines. It was a, it was a kind of downward spiral of into a dark hole of pessimism. Um, so let me... Um, can we fix Britain? Can we fix Britain? There we are. See, I've even, even dismissed the uh, first premise. Um, so uh, we have made enormous progress. Uh, Ten years ago, if you had a kind of uh, skin cancer called um, metastatic melanoma, um, you would, uh, and about 90% uh, of the people you know would be dead within a year. Um, about 90% uh, of people now survive between five and 10 years with metastatic melanoma. So that's a really, really good thing. But you have got to have had the disease uh, and got the disease in order to get that treatment in order to survive. And of course, the central premise is that we need people to um, agree to be treated or prevented uh, without ever having experienced the disease. My neighbor in the coffee shop, I haven't had flu and therefore I don't want to get flu and therefore I don't want to take the vaccination. Circular uh, argument. Um, but the really good news is that we've made enormous progress and I'll do a quick truncated version. So in the 1980s, um, first uh, observation that the immune system could be used to treat cancer uh, was, was made, um, the first medicine uh, was uh, delivered uh, to patients uh, in the uh, late 90s. Uh, there are now many, many medicines and many, many pathways, meaning that even for advanced cancers, so those in which have got secondaries, have had surgery, had radiation or chemotherapy and advanced, for most of those, 80% of those, the five-year survival rate is very, very good. So we're making an enormous progress, and that continues. We've now got therapies with cells, we've now got therapies with genes, and that will continue to progress and get better and better. But it's not, as the question asks, a cure. The only way um, is very, very early diagnosis. And the good news is that uh, screening techniques like cervical, uh, breast, uh, prostate, some of the major cancers are now colon in uh, those who are over 50 uh, in the UK make uh, really remarkable progress, pick those up. And there are effective cures uh, for those patients who's picked those diseases up uh, early, um, which is which is terrific. Um, so uh, finally, what my central premise is, is that science is, of course, important and central uh, to a cure for cancer. Um, but the answer is, is it the cure for cancer? No, because we need to think about how we use the data and work together. Nick. Thank you. Um, so uh, 
I've written this as if I've had five minutes. <laughs> so in, the, in this brief time about curing cancer, it's all about the science. I firstly want to focus on um, why cancer is more common now than in the past. Secondly, on how much things imp have improved, which Elliot's al already touched on. And finally, to flag up some of the um, big challenges that we face. So everyone here has heard about the one in two statistic about cancer, I assume, and seen the scary adverts on the TV, which often feature very young people with cancer um, who are, are, are quite poorly. And, and, and lots of people have the sense that something's going very wrong. However, essentially, in a country like Britain, um, we're, we're getting more cancer because we're living longer. We've got better sanitation, better health care, better, higher standards of living. So we're living lo much longer. Uh, if you die young, it's, um, you, which you often did, you have a lot less chance of developing cancer than if you become old. Uh, with the current, the highest rates of cancer in the UK are currently in the 85 to 89% age group, with half of all cancers being over 70 so it's something that's likely to be, you know, in half of our life journeys. Um, but many of, you know, the, the prognosis for having cancers have changed massively since the 1970s, really. Uh, before that, you know, we made a lot of headway in the 20th century with diseases, infectious diseases, with cardiovascular disease. But we didn't make much headway with cancer and getting a cancer diagnosis was not good. And I see these family trees from the past, you know, and people um, with, with uh, cancer susceptibility syndromes and other cancers, they just didn't do well um, when we look back in time. So uh, things are much better now. We've got prevention. You know, we've, we've got the HBPV vaccinations for young girls, which will decrease, hopefully, cervical cancer rates. Um, we've got other... Uh, uh, early detection and treatments and they've all improved with cancer survival rates in the UK increasingly increasing massively um, in the past 40 years overall and most cancers are entirely curable with minimal therapy if they're picked up early but obviously not all and survival rates vary hugely with the type of cancer and death rates of from all cancers combined have decreased more than two-thirds. Cancer studies in all forms are some of the best funded research in the world. And almost every day we do hear about new developments and in our understanding of cancer and the plethora of new tools, including genomics, the tailing of treatments and prevention to specific patients, new Im imaging technology and more specific targeted particle therapies. The cutting, burning and poisoning, which, were, you know, is still going on, but it's far more targeted and far more sophisticated than it was in the past. <coughs> so focusing specifically on the small group of patients that I work with as a genetic counsellor who have a risk of cancer susceptibility syndromes, this is only 5 to 10% of all cancer patients, um, uh, but they make up a high number of the young diagnosis with a very high uh, mortality rates without intervention. So they have uh, it has a big impact. So these patients, uh, unlike in the past, they now have the opportunity to find out if they've inherited the familial genetic change, if we can find it in the family, which we're increasingly able to, make decisions regarding preventative options, um, including... <laughs> A screening, chemo prevention, and sometimes risk reducing surgery. They also have the opportunity to have reproductive choices if they want to avoid having a child with the same gene change. Mm. Um, many people don't choose this because people are quite optimistic often about what the future will hold, and many cancer syndromes won't affect you till adulthood, but not all. Overall, the science around cancer and cancer treatment looks optimistic, but there are some serious challenges that we face for the benefits to be fully implemented for patients now and future generations. Recent studies have shown that the UK is falling behind other comparator countries with its one and five year survival rates, which is a big problem. 
So, I mean, one thing is we've had austerity in the NHS from the decade from 2008, and it had its biggest spending squeeze, the NHS, since its formation. And this, combined with the disastrous approach to the pandemic, which made things so much worse um, for cancer patients who got late diagnosis and ad- inadequate treatment and care. Now, the NHS is still running on hot. I'm still working in the NHS. I've retired and returned. <laughs> Only 15 hours a week. But I do love it still. <laughs> um, but the NHS is running on hot and desperately trying to play catch-up uh, with long waiting lists and inadequate staff with little Uh, capacity to focus on improvements and efficiencies. And there is a real vicious feedback loop in in terms of recruitment and selection, um, retention, sorry, (laughs) meaning that even new government initiatives aimed at speeding up diagnosis, such as the setting up of community diagnostic centres and mobile lung screening units, all really good things, struggle to find the staff to run them. There's an increasing number of people who are living with the side effects of cancer, as well as those having ongoing treatment over many years. These are obviously have health needs and need support for the health service. Um, And we, the chances of dying from cancer are much higher if you're poor. And the government make a lot uh, about. Much is made of the higher levels of smoking, which obviously is a very well-known carcinogen, but alcohol and obesity too, um, being higher in uh, in levels of sorry areas of deprivation. But I think this is a really complex issue and not one about ignorance. I mean, if you just look at nurses, a quarter of nurses are obese and smoke. I think they know about the health risks. Um, I think lifestyle choices, as they're called, uh, are are much more difficult depending on your life circumstances. For example, if you're working irregular shift work, the whole idea of having a regular time to pick up a hobby and some exercise is much more difficult. And really, if we want to do um, something about this, we need improved standard of living and, and also improved access to healthcare, because access to to healthcare is much worse in deprived areas. Uh, they have less, the, the, the GP practices have far more patients. Patients are often much later at seeing the GP, often due to when the GP being a, is available, not fitting in with their hours. Um, and the, the local health services are, are find it difficult to, re, even more difficult to recruit staff. So in conclusion, the high levels in a, uh, of cancer in a country like the UK is predominantly due to health, really, our longevity. Uh, prevention and early diagnosis and treatment are getting much better than in the past, but they are, we are failing to keep up with comparable countries. And uh, this is leading to very significant failures for patients. With a cancer patient's NHS journey often, often encompassing both the best of care and the worst of care. Curing cancers definitely not all about the science. Okay, I hope you can all hear me. I've activated my microphone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, you know, as you've already said, Ellie, it's a very strange thing becoming a cancer patient, and then you suddenly become a massive kind of fangirl of any scientist working in the in the whole field of uh, cancer genetics the, the you know the broad gamut so I'm delighted to be here to talk about it and to li- to listen as well and see what I can further learn um you know my own experience was quite extreme because I was diagnosed a few days before the first lockdown and you know literally the hospital that I was diagnosed in was kind of shutting down around us and the surgeon said, not only can we not operate, but I probably won't even be here for the next few months. And will this department be here? We can't tell you anything. Have this box of tamoxifen. Goodbye, basically. So it was pretty bad. And it was quite extreme. I ended up having a five-month delay to my uh, mastectomy. And then five months of chemo during the second wave of COVID, which, if you remember, was when the death toll really went very high. 
and was before any vaccines were available. It was great as they started coming through. That was obviously a massive turning point for the whole country, let alone people who were going through medical treatment. But I do remember I couldn't actually have the last two chemo doses because I became very poorly with it. And at that point, the nurses themselves in the chemo unit were very frightened because the COVID death toll was going up. And, you know, it was pretty bad, actually. You know, it was a pretty bad experience. And, um, you know, the reason I'm telling you that is because this morning in sort of researching our, 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 our discussion today, I went back and, and read a recently published interview in my own newspaper, the Financial Times, with the philosopher William McCaskill, who's an Oxford philosophy professor, talking about why it shouldn't be a priority to find a cure for cancer, um, saying it would only add 2% to uh, longevity worldwide. So I had an emotional reaction to that, as you would imagine, because it's hard not to take these things personally now. <laughs> Um, because I think it's quite interesting, you know, it's sort of, I've heard people in the world of, you know, the kind of UN circles, I suppose I could describe them, you know, talk about quite dismissively now of, you know, rich world lifestyle diseases and how they shouldn't be a priority. Because, of course, it's a massive global priority to, for example, find a cure for malaria, you know, which kills vastly more people than, than than what we're talking about today but it's sort of you know our, our you know our theme is is it just about the science i think there are lots of other things going on and this particular sort of global debate about whether we should even be prioritizing what what they call western lifestyle diseases you know is a is a topic of conversation so that's one thing you know you might have to start actually justifying your research elliot morally which is quite kind of interesting. Um, so that was one thing I thought was interesting to consider, the kind of morality of prioritising diseases which, are, which affect people like us who, you know, in terms of global comparisons, have pretty great lives. Um, I really enjoyed Nikki's uh, reminder that the one in two of us to get cancer figure is based on massive success of keeping us all alive much longer. I do think... Uh, you know, it's a very scary topic, cancer. I can't really describe to you the terror of getting a cancer diagnosis. It's like nothing I've ever experienced before and hope not to again. But, you know, the context is is important, right? Um, you know, cancer is part of our biology, you know, this bizarre way in which cells replicate and where they then end up and whether it's a benign thing or or, or a malignant thing is part of our biology. And the longer we stay alive, the more we're liable to uh, fall foul of, of of malignancy. So I think it's really good to sort of to sort of contextualise that. You know, for for breast cancer, which which two of us here have, have have been through recently, you know, your risk factors are being female and living longer. You know, that's basically basically it. So I'm quite pleased about both of those things being true of me. So so you know, and and as for the rest of it, it's still a bit of a mystery. Um, I thought it was really nice also that we're having this discussion today because on a more cheerful note, you know, the, the, the star guests this morning on the Kunzberg programme, I don't know how many of you actually saw it, was the, the uh, husband and wife professorial duo at the heart of BioNTech talking about how, you know, having harnessed their mRNA technology to the COVID vaccine, the progress they're making with individualised cancer vaccines. And they actually said, well, by 2030, we should be able to actually get this to patients, which I thought was an amazing thing to hear and buoyed me up on my journey here this afternoon. Because I think, you know, when you're a patient, it's very peculiar because they never use the word cure. I don't know if you also had this experience, but yes. the word cure is not ever, but even if you have something that's quite a well-trodden path, like a hormonal breast cancer, which is, you know, more than one in eight women in the UK, they only talk about treatment. They don't talk about cure. And that's because they don't really know what's going on. And all they can do is put you on, on, on a path which has the, the benign effect of improving your probabilities of survival all the time. So it's very weird. You become data, you know. Um, you become a data point. Is that right? You become a, you, so you become a data point and all you can do is put your own factors into strange online models which then give you back numbers that you may or may not be happy about reading. You know, so that's kind of quite a strange feeling. Um, but that's because 
the, the, the medicine is basically, well, we've tried this and this works, right? It's not actually particularly at the level of why did you get this disease in the first place? And in fact, as well as finding the talk of treatment not cure spooky as a patient uh, and the, the sort of probabilities uh, quite emotionally hard to deal with, the thing that I found absolutely fascinating was just how many of the questions that you ask as a patient, the answer is we don't know. Why have I got this disease? We don't know. Why are one in eight women in the UK getting breast cancer? Yeah. We don't know. Uh, why, why did it happen to me? No one in my family has ever had any sort of cancer before, as far as I, I know. So it's not one of those tiny proportion of genetic uh, cancers. You know, so, so that, that question, why me? Why is this, why is this hit, you know, why is this bolt of lightning hit me? We don't know. Um, and how can I stop it coming back? We don't know. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. So, so clearly the science is amazing. And as a patient, you sort of put your faith in the science. And I feel as if my mission, your mission, our mission, is to stay enough, to stay alive so that we benefit of all these amazing scientific discoveries, which are really happening every 15, 18, 24 months now. I mean, it's phenomenal what's happening in cancer science. Um, but, you know, I think that Nikki is absolutely right. You know, there are lots of other problems. You know, access to the diagnosis and the treatment is quite poor, actually. And if you look at the map, Cancer Research UK have actually produced a map of regional variations in both diagnosis and treatment. And it's really bad. And it absolutely exactly maps social deprivation in the UK. You know, we really, that is a conversation that I have, unless I'd been actually investigating it for the long piece that I wrote for the FT, I would not have known that, that we have such a problem with access even to the, the first steps of treatment. So that's kind of negative. Um, and, yeah, and, and early detection, the, the other, is it just the science? No, the early detection, it's, I'm very pleased that the government has had this focus on, on these diagnostic centres because, in my view, the way that we structured the NHS with the GP practice as the gateway to all treatment no longer works because of the volume of demand on the GP practices and because they are not up to date with all the diagnostics and that is where a lot of problems are creeping in and that's the end of my disquisition. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so people can ask any questions they want or make comments. So there's some microphones around somewhere. Um, just one thing, just as a question, if you could bear this in mind. With the, so the, the importance of vaccination, and then you talked, Elliot, about the whole question of um, societal responses to vaccination. Pfizer is obviously massively, so the people that were on the telly, massively, I mean, I would say even hated by at the moment by a lot of people that they're getting a huge amount of stick as far as I can see. Um, but one of the things that strikes me about the HPV vaccine is how remarkably uncontroversial it's been. And I, I don't really understand why because of the patient group involved, um, the fact that it's to do with sex. It's, it's, it seems to have all the ingredients of a thing that would make people really not go against a vaccine but it's been really introduced beautifully uncontroversially and as far as I understand it very high take up so I'm curious about that yeah 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 really really successful uh, right um so let's start at the back is the two mics do you want to bring this what you so you go backwards with that one well let's just stay on this side but it give it to that guy there I'll do this side and then that side <coughs> Thank you very much. I just want to expand um, on the point on COVID and vaccination uh, given by the first speaker. So what we saw with COVID um, was this disease that uh, uh, was that it was uh, it was essentially elevated above medical ethics. Uh, uh, so the point it was elevated in the media as this great big evil that we need to do everything we can to combat uh, and medical ethics be be damned in some case uh, there was there was no consideration for that uh, as a result we have seen uh, some downright unethical practices in association with the covid vaccine uh, the rush development of it uh, shortcuts taken in clinical trials informed consent being either sidestepped or just completely ignored uh, the extreme being in austria was actually mandated now cancer uh, has has had a lot of uh, charity media uh, and, and, of course, uh, research budget uh, resources thrown at it uh, because, of course, naturally, 
it is uh, it affects uh, all of us really um is there not a danger that the same thing can happen with cancer and that we can also see some unethical practices associated with it emerging even if it's difficult uh, to think of uh, possible examples at the moment um well, uh, what is possible is only limited by the imagination, really. So, uh, and where does medical ethics uh, generally uh, play into uh, the so-called war against cancer? Um, do you want to you go and then bring this that microphone down here to this this side to that hand there? I'm just going to do this side, and then I'll come over there. Uh, one comment and one question following on from your comments, actually. Um, the anti-vax label, um, which is highly emotional. Um, I'm a New Zealander and I am very disturbed in New Zealand uh, that freedom of speech seems to have been shut down. So we have qualified doctors and scientists um, who over the last two and a half years have not been allowed to raise questions. So as experts, they haven't been allowed to raise questions. I personally know doctors in New Zealand who have lost their practising licence due to raising questions and being disciplined by the New Zealand Medical Council. So it's the freedom of expression issue that I have a problem with. I, I think we should be expressing, qualified people should be able to express doubts and questions and have those addressed by the government or, or the other side. That's what this whole weekend is about. We celebrate freedom of expression. So that's my bit on that. My question um, is, I, I'm, I, I'd be intrigued if anybody's got any information on whether cannabis-related products have been, whether they believe that they are helpful in the cancer journey. I think they might be, but I don't know what the evidence is. Uh, so give that microphone to the woman there. Yeah, you go. So. Oh, oh, sorry. Thank, thank you. Um, very quickly, um, based on the lady, the last lady's comments about uh, the GP gateway uh, isn't working anymore. Um, how do you see we can have a sort of vaccine type walk-in or regulated walk-in system p for testing, for pre-screening, particularly in relation to uh, the belief that I believe there may be blood tests available quite soon. And very quickly, for the first gentleman, it might seem a little bit off topic, but... Um, I've seen the consequences of failure to pick up on the behavior of malign personalities and the damage they can cause in an organization. What were the warning signs about Andrew Wakefield? Thank you. That's a serious... serious. Um, you, you go bring this mic down to the front here. Yes, madam. My understanding is that um, certain diseases are very strongly influenced by genetics, such as sickle cell anemia um, and Huntington's disease. And other diseases like cancer are partly influenced by genetics and partly influenced by lifestyle factors. So perhaps that's why in the uh, more deprived areas you see the lifestyle factors actually raising the risk of cancer. Um, of the people who do have genetic variants that predispose them to cancer, what is the actual risk of that person developing cancer? Or is the, are the lifestyle factors still a very strong influence? And if so, is there, are there any plans for a national rollout of genetic, predictive genetic testing so that jo those with the genetic variants that predispose them to cancer could perhaps take some lifestyle actions to help prevent them from developing the disease? Right, in Thank a minute, you. I'll get Nikki to come back on that. I think that's really a question for you. Um, so if you go, sir, and then I'll come back to the front and then I'll come over to this side, OK? My question is about um, uh, picking up cancers. Presumably, the earlier a cancer is picked up, the easiest is to treat, but there's a limit to how often you can uh, test people. I think I get, um, I'm now going to test every two years for colon cancer. I've had tests for prostate cancer. Well, I've had prostate problems. I don't think it's to do with cancer, but I guess it's uh, one of these things you get when you get older. Are there any uh, pros, you know, you, could you actually have a universal cancer test? How do you go about it? I mean, how often will you really need to test people in order to pick it up before it gets 
difficult to treat and there are so many different cancers out there, would it be possible to combine a number of cancer tests or is it really a case of waiting for people to not feel that well going to their GPs and saying, please, I think I've got a problem, uh, can you test me? Okay. Uh, Nikki, do you want to go first and then Elliot and Miranda? And then we'll come over here. <clears throat> so specifically on the genetics and cancer, um, yeah, the, the sort of 5 to 10% of people that have an inheritable cancer syndrome, uh, in all the cells in their body, they will for have all your genes come in pairs. We've got about 20,000 instructions in all. In all the cells in their body, they will have one working copy of that particular instruction and one spelling mistake. So we cancer happens because of mutations. They haven't got a backup copy, if you like. So the rates of cancer are sometimes extremely high. Like if you have a bowel cancer syndrome called hereditary adenomous polyposis, uh, unsurprisingly called FAP for short, you have literally hundreds of polyps in your bowel, often by, uh, you know, 12, 13 years of age. And you will 100% develop cancer if there's no intervention. So it does vary according to the specific cancer syndrome, but the rates are very much higher. Lifestyle will play a role with these cancer syndromes, like, for example... Um, you know, with a BRCA1 gene change, uh, there were lower rates of breast cancer. They were still very high, I have to say. But like, you know, in the 1950s than today, you know, some of the points that Ellie was referring to, women choosing to have ch ch children later and less children have play a big influence. So, you know, when we talk about lifestyle, other things come into it. We always think, don't we, about drinking, eating and, and smoking. And lifestyle is a lot broader than that. In terms of the general population and genetics and environmental factors, we really don't understand it yet. Uh, those genetic factors will play a role. There are things called um, polygenic risk scores, which are being explored more in relation to cancer. There is you know, thought about doing things like including polygenic risk scores with lifestyle factors, um, uh, you know, with like how old you were when you had your first child, when you started your periods, all the, what, hey, what um, contraception you used, all these things, and family history to make, say, something like breast screening more personalised so that some people would get very much more screening right. and other people would get less because... For one in 10 women treated uh, that have screening, for every one woman that's picked up with breast cancer through the National Breast Screening Programme, 10 have unnecessary treatment. Mm -hmm. So you could, you know, we're not, uh, so I suppose I'm not saying take screening away from, from um, higher risk women and that higher risk can come about through a complex um, amount, uh, uh, complex data. Hmm. Very interesting. Elliot. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I think there are, uh, there are a couple of questions here which probably warrant uh, an entire session on their own. Uh, yeah. uh, Pfizer and uh, BioNTech, the two major producers um, of uh, vaccines, uh, along with AstraZeneca and another company called Moderna, I suspect the major objection is that they have made billions of dollars um, during this process, um, including AstraZeneca, who said they weren't going to make billions, just not as many billions. I think paying for drugs, healthcare is probably a different session. I also, the, the, our friend from the Antipodes, um, I think general comment, uh, moving um, health directly into the realms of politics uh, is uh, a real issue. The argument being that we've got to get the uh, herd inoculated in order to prevent um, the deaths that many models uh, thought that there would be. The, I, I agree there was some aberrant behavior that went on. But let me come to a couple of other things. So I'm, I'm very heartened by the uptake of HPV vaccine. It's, it's an incredible thing. And I, and I actually be good to know why it's done that. Yeah. But, but it's a, a horrific fact. Horrific is probably the wrong word. Uh, but the reality is that head and neck cancer um, has... Um, increased many fold um, with the um, change in 
uh, sexual behaviors um, of uh, people um, because uh, HPV, the virus, uh, human papillomavirus, um, is um, associated with uh, a lot of head and neck cancers. And where that comes from um, is from uh, genitourinary uh, contact. So um, I'm not going to be more explicit than that, but I'll let you work it out for yourself, right? Um, so it, it used to be... Yes, right. Okay, all right, got it. Oral sex is what you're talking about. It is oral sex, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I should have just said that, shouldn't I? <laughs> it, would have, it, would have, it would have stopped the Times crossword version of oral sex. Um, so I think, that, I think a couple of things. To specifically to Andrew Wakefield, Andrew Wakefield tried to promote a, um, the relationship in the first instance between, um, before he got to autism, between inflammatory bowel disease uh, and MMR vaccine. It was clearly rubbish. Um, that was turned down. That was the interaction I had with him. Didn't fund it. Um, he then went from there to autism, where there's a more susceptible family and patient population. Um, it, the writing was on the wall from the beginning with that gentleman, I'm afraid, and it continues to be the case. Um, the, the aspiration for uh, a walk-in uh, gene screen, uh, we're probably not that far away from picking most of it off. There's a thing called circulating tumor DNA, so ctDNA, which all tumors, even those in their very beginnings, uh, kick off into our circulation. We can probably take a blood sample or maybe even a saliva sample ultimately and take a look at a lot of those and we'll see it early. It's the next, you know, five to 10 years. And, and I'll finally leave you with this in this round. Is there anyone in the room who's 93 or older? If you want to admit it, no. So, so it definitely is the uh, point that once you get in your mid fifties through the mid seventies, early eighties, you're sort of in, um, you know, snipe rally with respect to uh, cancer, but there's a really remarkable piece which says by the time you get into your early 90s, then the cancer risk drops off absolutely enormously. So if you get to 93, you can celebrate uh, 93, and you and it's probably not the it's not the cancer which will get you; it's the uh, Alzheimer's disease. So that's all right. Um, that is really. Um, fascinating on oral sex I've read quite a few papers well it's just one of those things isn't it it's a kind of um dilemma of health messaging so I've read a lot of papers about this recently to do with changes in um how, how young people define sex and what sexual activity is in the context of um decades of, of safe sex campaigns um, and very strong efforts by governments to um, address the alleged problem of teenage pregnancy. Um, and what a lot of this research seems to be showing is that it is indeed the case that um, sexual practices have, have shifted away from penetrative sex to other definitions of sex and what younger people think sex is. Um, so that is... Really interesting. The other thing I, th I think is interesting, I mean, I think you're right on the whole question around vaccination and responses to the pandemic and, you know, there's so many issues circulating around that. I do think, though, that um, what you think about the whole thing, just how much it's shaped by the extent to which you were close to hospitals and illness. So for my own part, I was the same as, you know, I'm so happy that there's been a vaccine because if you were um, in anywhere near a hospital and having anything to do with chemotherapy um, you were very worried about it and vaccination was absolutely you know and anyway so I think that's interesting how perceptions of, of things what you know what influences them and, and, and how you then think about um, the various companies involved and what have you. Miranda. Um, I just wanted to give a very brief answer on cannabis, actually, because a friend of mine who sadly didn't make it, who had bowel cancer very early, completely missed until it was very advanced because she was of an age where, you know, she didn't look like a normal bowel cancer patient to her GPs, essentially. Um, but towards the end of her life, and while she was having chemo when it had gone to her bones and, you know, she was in a lot of pain in the last few months and you know her mother and her girlfriend 
you know, had to go to dealers to get her cannabis oil, which she found incredibly effective for pain relief, for anxiety, for, as you can imagine, a whole bunch of issues swirling around somebody in the last months of their life. Um, and I think that's an outrage. I think it's an outrage that her mother and her girlfriend should have had to run the risk of falling foul of the law to help her get what was helping her in the last months of her life. So I can't obviously speak about any therapeutic, anything therapeutic, but I think for palliative care, it's an absolute no-brainer. Um, on, on the other question of sort of walking the, you know, access to blood tests and screening as, as more sophisticated testing becomes available. This is so interesting. Somebody very senior in the NHS said to me, you know, what we're going to be dealing with is, you know, if you think that the questions about access to treatment are bad now, imagine what it's going to be like as the diagnostics get better. Because, you know, already the NHS trying to cope with the backlog from the pandemic of getting people into screening, getting people tested, getting people diagnosed, and then working out how the hell you can get everyone treated in, in good time is really difficult. Imagine how that's going to be once we have the blood tests, that, um, you know, and once we've tried to tackle the inequalities in access to diagnosis to get those hard to reach people who aren't being diagnosed. I mean, then you've really got massive, massive numbers of cancer patients to try and get through the system. Okay. On that. Yeah, so so if you if you tie the uh, deprivation to diagnosis together, so so I work with uh, Manchester University scientifically, and um, one of their areas, of course, around Manchester is Oldham. Uh, one of the um, challenges uh, that were there were were English as a second language, so it's not just deprivation, but it's the other barriers, uh, and unfortunately, so uh, lung cancer, the most uh, common time lung cancer was diagnosed in Oldham uh, was in A&E. So patients are walking in coughing up blood and they were diagnosed. They're essentially dead by that stage. They're not. There are very few of them. It's very difficult at that stage to bring it back. Uh, so what um, Manchester University did, which I think is brilliant, is then essentially put um, diagnosis in vans and went into the communities to the local shop or uh, club or housing authority and were able to access and started to bring that uh, cancer rate down. So, so it's there are two levels. There's one is just getting the diagnosis for those things that we know how to diagnose in place. Uh, then it's the kind of the next wave, which is and things we will be able to diagnose in the future, and it needs an entirely different capacity. And just to go off topic slightly, um, and I don't want to stir a hornet's nest up here, but but in essence, the design of the NHS we have right now is wrong. Um, and, the, and we can talk about GP separately, but if you get beyond GP, we have both acute and chronic patients in the same institutions, mm -hmm. and they have different problems. And one of the issues with bed blocking, for example, is you've got chronic patients in acute settings. So you've got someone who's had a motor accident mm -hmm. is blocked by someone who's got a degenerative disease. What we need are two NHSs, yeah. um, and one which deals with chronic diseases, and they're designed for very, very different things, and one which deals deals with acute diagnosis, car accidents, et cetera, et cetera, and patients who are likely to be out of that service. That is an enormous political issue. People who are setting up NHSs for the very first time, so if you look in the Middle East, look in other parts of the world, are addressing this up front. So you, so you segregate uh, those two things. I know that's off topic, but I thought I'd add. Yeah, that, I don't know if people were here in this session before on GPs, but this that whole thing really came up as part of that one. Right over here... Um, so, do you want to go to the back? Who wears the other mic? Oh, you go to the back, and you can go give that give yours to that lady there. And um, so I'm, I'll come back over this side in a minute. Can you go over there and give that to the lady at the back? First speaker touched on this, but I wanted to expand a little bit. At the beginning of your speech, you talked about um, four or five sort of causes of cancer, and that's what's of interest to people a lot. You know, um, could you say a little bit more about that? Um, so just go back to wherever the next hand back is. Uh, uh. Anyway, thank you. It's been a very interesting discussion. Um, I don't think... Um, now, with GPs, the problem is that most GPs haven't seen certain diseases, and they'll get one in, during their lifetimes. And I've seen it myself and my family, how things are missed because... They just haven't seen it. And a lot of cancers get diagnosed in casualty. So when someone goes vomiting, you know, blood, whatever, or coughing up blood. Anyway, um, so yes, um, there should be a sort of different 
way of trying to catch these people early. Um, also, um, I think, you know, with complementary medicine, I would say that I would use both allopathic and complementary. I don't see any problem. I don't think they're antagonistic. Um, the NHS is structured in such a way, it's got procedures which don't allow for <clears throat> improvisation because if a GP said something and it wasn't, you know, as the procedure should be, then he'd get into trouble or she. And so um, I think that, uh, you know, remember that today's science is tomorrow's redundant idea. So I think allow complementary medicine to explore certain things. And certainly if people read things and inform themselves how to eat better, do more exercise, and if it's in that area, why not? And so I certainly don't and I think with, with Macmillan and the kind of complementary therapies they provide for cancer patients in hospitals, uh, like massage or yoga, or whatever, great. I mean, it really helps patients. So um, I think they should support each other and not be, you know, let one do one thing and one the other and let's see what works um, for people. As far as COVID vaccines, I know more people who've been damaged than who've actually, um, from the vaccines really, it's quite extraordinary, um, than from um, having COVID. So it's just anecdotal evidence, but it kind of makes one a bit concerned. So I'm not anti-vax at all. And it's once more, you know, I think, look at, see, see what works and learn from it. So um, you whatever. The microphone to the but thank you. Over there. Uh, so Paul, you go now, yeah. Oh no, yeah, sorry, there. Yeah, and then you can give it to Paul. Uh, yes. Yes. On the on the vaccine. Yes, I'd agree with that uh, lady there before. I mean, there's no comparison between the HPV uh, vaccine and the COVID vaccine. I mean, the COVID vaccine has been a, a big money maker, and we and there's been a lot of secrecy around the data, and that's the biggest problem around the whole COVID thing. And also, I mean, the COVID vaccine is not a cure and that's what the biggest uh, talk about it is at the moment is whereas the HPV vaccine is a cure and and I think the cervical cancer is one of those that uh, does kill very quickly so um, it's not surprising it's been take, taken up um, so what uh, well, I wanted to say I, I did have cancer myself and one of the things I was surprised, this is about five years ago, so I'm a survivor, um, was that there was no data collected. I mean, we talk about science and, you know, solving the issues around cancer. I, was ex I would expect, you know, a whole load of data to be collected on the type of rectal cancer I had to, to, so that they could put that into some uh, system and work out statistics of what, you know, my lifestyle was characteristics of my personal characteristics. So that would help the understanding of these sciences and who gets them. No wonder, you know, when people go and say, what, why did I get it? They have no answers because they don't collect the data. So how are they going to have the answers? Well, so what the panel think of that? Okay, so pass that there. Um, go at the back, yeah. Uh, thank you. I would like to say there have been some very good comments so far. Thank you for all the comments. And... I actually work as a urologist and I deal with prostate cancer. I have a prostate cancer clinic every Monday. And I would like to ask the panel their opinions on the talk of the debate is whether we can cure cancer with science. And I'd actually say that we can cure cancer with science, but with what cost? I could cure every man in this room of prostate cancer immediately by taking out every single prostate. <laughs> but everyone will end up incontinent and they'll have no erections. So what cost are we going to accept for curing cancer? And I think there's a same, similar question for screening. We could screen everyone with very, very small tests that don't do very many, uh, don't, they're not very invasive, or we could have more accurate tests that are very, very invasive and have more side effects. Where's the level that we choose to address the cost that we're going to go for and what we're going to achieve by screening everyone. Okay. Um, could somebody bring that microphone down to the front here because there's two people here next after Paul? Yeah, first I just want to say, having been to meeting, lots of meetings all day, uh, from the panel, you is the most optimistic 
um, panel. And if you said at the start of the day, yeah, the most optimistic discussion will be about cancer. I reckon, really? Amazing. Um, Mike can be very short because mine was about screening as well. Um, we often hear that the important thing is early detection. And we're currently, you know, so aware of things we have to check, whether it's our balls, boobs or shit, most recently. So I, I just wanted to know those, I, what you, th same question really, is like, what is universal screening a sensible thing? And I, perhaps I could ask a specific question, is that when it comes to breast cancer, should we carry on doing universal screening? Or has it become so politically charged that you, you couldn't, even if it, even if you, if you want to introduce it now, you wouldn't do it. it. We can't get rid of it now because it's embedded in our culture. Okay. So a couple of people here, then I'm going to take really quick comments from the front. Yeah, a 22-year cancer survivor. And uh, interesting, <laughs> interesting to hear what you're saying about uh, GPs. I, didn't, I was so healthy, I didn't have a GP. Hmm. And so I went to the A&E and just waited until someone saw me. And when I was diagnosed quick sticks, they said, thank God you didn't have a GP because they never would have caught this. Um, but uh, my question is more about um, the um, uh, long-term studies. I was on a study and uh, I later discovered that it was a study of seven and in fact, um, it was so rarefied that it was a machine. Uh, when, I, when I was in this machine, doctors appeared from Greece and America to come and stare at my boobs. And thank goodness I'd grown up in the 1970s south of France and, and was quite happy to show my boobs. But when they were going, ooh, ah, it wasn't because of my beautiful boobs. It was because how well they could see the cancer. <laughs> but, you know, you seem to suggest that there was some reluctance for people to take part in these studies and why would that be? So you can pass it now, yeah. <laughs> um, hi, I just wanted to uh, <coughs> um, uh, see if you could... Um, <coughs> I was thinking about the, the, um, the issue of diet in prevention of cancer and it's, it's well known that cancer cells use glucose as a method of energy generation, the, the, the uh, mitochondria um, ferment <coughs> glucose. And that's, the PET scans work by, you give the patient a dose of a drink high in glucose with a radioactive dye, and the, the cancer cells suck up the glucose in preference to normal cells that, that it, they outcompete with. So cancer cells have got a, um, a predisposition to sucking up glucose. So that's evidence that diet has got, can feed cancer cells um, preferentially. There are three types of fuel that you know, come through digestion. You get ketone, <coughs> ketones, glucose, and glycogen. If glucose and glycogen can be restricted through a low carbohydrate diet um would that not slow the progression okay. of cancer all right so ju just pick up on one point each do you want to go first miranda well i know and so then you have to talk to people afterwards as well um do you want to say something um yes the downsides of screening and the downsides of radical cancer treatment i mean these are brilliant brilliant questions we could definitely do an hour on these you know, chemo is no fun, I'm telling you. You know, I definitely, it's like no stars would not recommend this holiday. Um, but on the other hand, I was absolutely delighted to be offered it because I don't want to have my cancer back again, you know. Um, but obviously some people, even with the surgery alone, is seriously affects their quality of life f for the rest of their life. So, you know, I think it's very good, actually, that to emphasise informed patient consent. And what more can you do, really, at the moment would just be my comment on that. But, I mean, there is obviously a line at which you're treating people to the point which their quality of life is too, is yes. too low. And that is obviously a huge ethical, ethical dilemma. Um, just on the thing about the sugar... I mean, I probably, I think probably every single cancer patient asks their oncologist afterwards, what can I do to stop this ever happening again? Should I do this? Or that? I asked the question about sugar. She said to me, you think we haven't thought of that? It's not, you know, this has got nothing to do with anything. Booze is really bad. 
So you're advised not to booze or to keep it absolutely minimal. And exercise is really, really, really good. And since I really like red wine and I hate sport, these are not happy messages. But sugar, we all ask and they say, no, nothing, no evidence. Nikki? Um, On this thing about screening, uh, I think that before we start, you know, if the breast national breast screening programme... Many people disagree with the National Breast Screening Programme as it's set up now, um, and it 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 wouldn't really fulfil the criteria for a screening programme um, it, because of the amount of of harm and overdiagnosis. Uh, that's not. To, I mean, I've argued just to 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 um, that it should be more targeted, not that we we shouldn't have it at all. But so I think it's really important that before we rush into any more screening programmes, um, you know, that they're thoroughly assessed. I mean, one thing that has been introduced, which is the National Bowel Screening Programme, and they're rolling that out younger because about 20% of people in their 50s will have polyps in their bowels. And those polyps, if left for a long time, can go on to become bowel cancer when you're older. Um, and so, you know, it's it's a very easy test. Uh, just putting a bit of, of your stool sample and sending it off. And yes, there are there is an, uh, an element of overdiagnosis, but it's such a, an effective thing to remove polyps that it seems a reasonable one. PSA testing in men, uh, they did try it uh, in all men, and it was a complete Awful. nightmare. Um, you know. The amount of overdiagnosis was huge because if you live a very long time, you will have, you know, prostate cancer, but it won't be a problem to you. Now, having said that, if you've got a BRCA2 gene change and you're a man and you have a high PSA test, it's probably worth them investigating because the cancers can be very aggressive and of a different nature. Though having a sort of blood test for cancer, it all sounds wonderful, but you know, again, overdiagnosis, really. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Elliot? Okay, I'll be quick. Um, <clears throat> on the, I think the, ec- the economic question asked by the two gents uh, over in the, against the windows is exactly right. They ultimately become choices. They become choices of therapeutic intervention versus economy versus outcome. And as the tests get more and more widely available, then society is going to have to make those decisions as well because there are downstream consequences of a positive test. And finally, to the... Two ladies with their vaccine experience with COVID. Uh, I'm sorry you believe that, but nonsense is all I can say. Okay. Um, so last few questions and then quick semi up from the floor. Tony, did you want to ask? You, you look like you're going. I thought we wanted to ask something. <laughs> it was on the screening in the early Oh, okay. Covered really all right. Well. Where were the other hands? There were some, a couple more over here. Yep. <laughs> Hi, so thank you for the discussion. It's very interesting. Uh, But I feel like we're missing a little bit of um, context because we are really just concentrating on the physical side of our self, yeah? And the mind is still there. And uh, I feel um, there is just, like, every time something happens to you, it gives you a sign, especially your body, like... If you get a flu, I mean, yes, the virus, everything has been around there, but you caught it and you, your body is really giving you signs, yeah? So I'm just wondering if you could maybe reflect on the fact that we are not really living in our bodies, we're just living in our heads, and that might be really having a strong impact on everything that happens. And another thing I wanted to mention is, so we are really used to um, giving away the ownership of our bodies when something happens to us, to doctors and and, yeah. And isn't that very important to really stay connected to ourselves? Um, I mean, yes, I trust doctors and I, I, I really am happy for the progress and everything, but isn't that a really important uh, part and, and part of the discussion? Because we are really, really concentrated on the scientific okay. side. Right. But yeah. Any more? Last I could take maybe one more. Okay, so I'm going to take some last comments from the front. Just on. Um, oh no, sorry. No, 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 no. You've. Oh, God. 
No, it's no, no, no. Only, only if there's anyone who hasn't said anything before. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. Here, lady at the front. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, I know you can treat all sorts of cancers, and it's uh, it, you know it's it's fantastic. I'd I'd love to hear from a medical perspective, and I know we talked. You talked about patient consent, but but the the point my eighty six year old dad had a whipple. It prolonged a life. I wouldn't say enhanced the the next few months of his life. Do do the doc? How do the doctors look at that? I'd I'd be really interested. Obviously, he consented. He wanted to. Uh, what? What, would the doctors intervene? At what, you know, what point do you... I, I'd love to hear what, yeah. the, the thought process there. Okay. All right, so I'm going to um, take last comments from the front. Um, just one thing in response to the lady that said the thing about being in touch with your own body. Um, I mean, many of us can be um, completely not, i.e. feel completely healthy, but cancer starting. Mm. Um, which is one of the reasons for the screening campaign. So if it, if it, I, I, it was my experience, I had absolutely no symptoms and, and went for routine screening and, and they discovered early cancer. So, no pardon? 100% of the people I see with prostate cancer have, have no symptoms. symptoms. Exactly, exactly. So that's kind of why you need science and medicine a bit. Right. <coughs> um, Thanks. Uh, so I, I'd like to end on an optimistic note. I think um, science has carried us an enormous distance with respect to the treatment of cancer. Uh, the next 10 to 15 years will see us move even further with respect to the prevention. We haven't even touched on gene editing, uh, which is the next. So CRISPR technology, being able to identify genes, knock them out early so it prevents coming on. But, but there's a whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. And that really does get into medical ethics because, you know, where do you stop disease versus characteristic um, very optimistic about the future uh, if you get an option for a screen take it um, and there we are okay thank you I know I only have you say. difficult um, on age and was it about treatment about treatment of cancer in older age I think yeah, yeah. so I think that's really difficult given half of cancers are over 70 and I think it's really important that assumptions aren't made about, you know, we won't treat this person, they're old, we have to talk to them and look at their individual circumstances and not make the, a judgment on the base of chronological age, really. But, yeah, I mean, obviously, a good life is not just about an absence of disease, and I think we need to be mindful of that in all these discussions. OK, thank you. Um, yeah, well, I'm glad we've been an optimistic... <laughs> panel on the, such a grim subject that's made me very happy um i just want to say one thing about the screening questions because there were quite a lot of them and i think there is a bit of a downer on breast screening and i just wanted to say that it does pick up a lot of cancers and in fact in france you're screened from the age of 40 whereas here it's 50 i believe and in france you're screened once a year from the age of 40 and their outcomes are better than ours so let's not you know go crazy about this and also mine was not picked up by screening and it wouldn't have been because I have had something called lobular cancer, which is really hard to see on a normal, normal mammogram. It wasn't even visible on an ultrasound without a biopsy. And then on an MRI, I turned out to have a five and a half centimetre big tumour, which I had felt several months previously. And the GP told me it was just my age because things get a bit lumpy and bumpy. So my message would be, please don't let's stop the screening. But also the screening is sometimes not enough because it doesn't pick everything up. So if you have symptoms, please be insistent because... GPs, as somebody said, only see some cancers occasionally, and even on really common cancers, they might tell you to go away and it'll, you know, sort itself out. And it's, if it's a five and a half centimetre tumour, it's not going to do that. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>